So, as you know, it's been a long time, and uh, I'm, I'm kind of proud to talk about the Neon's report um, as something that we've completed. And uh, since I've taken over as principal, we've been working on this, so it's been a long time. Um, tonight is the first public release of the document, and I have copies for you afterwards if you want one. I also have it on PDF, and I was going to send it to the board tomorrow as well uh, as a PDF. So the process began a long time ago, um, not in the galaxy far away. <laughs> but certainly a long time ago, uh, in uh, 2011, late in the year, the first order of business for us was to develop our core values as a school and to develop our learning expectations. That process took um, about five or six months to do. Uh, that process involved getting input from students, from parents, from the board, and from teachers as well. Um, the teachers worked very hard on several in-service days to craft that and to craft the core values. Once we established the core values, we then moved on to the learning expectations, which we're still using, and you'll see that they're mentioned prominently several times in the report. Uh, our self-study officially launched in September 2011 and it concluded in June 2013. During the 2012-2013 school year, we spent a lot of time with each committee, um, bringing a report to the faculty, faculty hearing that report, and then either approving or sending it back for revision. Um, every single report we gave was approved in the first time, and as we developed the report, uh, we kind of knew what we wanted to do as a school. We kind of knew what we thought the NEAS committee was going to say when they showed up. Uh, the visit, as you remember, happened November 17th through November 20th, and it was a uh, long visit again on that Sunday afternoon with May Rubante running through the, through the banner. And, uh, it was, it was actually a very positive visit. Uh, members from the committee um, from three of those schools have expressed interest in bringing teams back here to study various aspects of BUHS. So um, those professionals felt that we were doing a lot of things right. Uh, this past March, I received the um, draft report. I read it over, had several conversations with Brian Beck, who was the um, chair of the visiting committee. Um, he and I had a lot of conversations. Um, we moved a lot of commas around, and, but the basic report and the content was pretty consistent from the draft to the final copy. We got that copy in April uh, this year. And then uh, one of the things that we thought a lot about was how were we going to release it. In previous visits, we've just kind of thrown it on the faculty room table and said, take a look. Um, but we didn't want to do that because we felt that a lot of the information in that report um, required that we slow down and looked at it a little bit at a time. So what we asked each of the committees to do was to take their section of the report, review it, compare it to the self-study they, they, they prepared, and then compare and contrast the recommendations that the NEAC made with the recommendations that they made. And that process, we did that over a couple of weeks. And that process seemed to be good because I think people came away with a better understanding of you know, what the report contained. Um, overall, the report contains 71 commendations and 52 recommendations. That's not an attempt to keep score. Um, unlike years past, they no longer rate the school in various areas. They used to rate them exemplary, proficient, uh, needs improvement, and um, oh, let's get out of here, I think, something like that. And they don't do that anymore. I, I asked about that. I said, so don't they rank it anymore? And they said, we do, but it's not public and you don't see it. So somebody has our report card, wow. um, but we don't. And that's okay. Um, just to refresh your memory, here are the standards that we looked at. And this kind of takes the school apart, everything from core values to community support, and looks at it a little piece at a time. And so what I'd like to do is kind of go through and just share with you from each of those standards, what the faculty thought were the highlights. And then we'll talk more about the letter from NEASC and what that means a little bit. <coughs> but I want to share with you what the faculty saw in their reports as being the most important recommendations and recommendations. So with core values, uh, I wasn't surprised about this. The development process got high marks. It was a very inclusive process even down to the fact that we had a contest to design the core value logo um, using students. Um, we were commended for the rigorous learning expectations. Um, one of our commendations later on is to 
do a better job of implementing those. And you'll see that in a little bit. And uh, we got, I just like the word ubiquitous, and they used it. So I thought I'd share it. Uh, they like our ubiquitous use of core values and learning expectations. So they thought that was good, that we've actually began to put into the culture of the school. Um, we have a ways to go, but at least we know it's in the culture of the school and being used. Um, for recommendations, they wanted to make sure that we remember to review those. So in other words, we don't just put them on the wall and forget about them, that we continue to use them. Um, I think you see that when we talk about the 1% work we do, we ask people to relate them to the core values. As we work with the teachers on professional development and with students, we try to come back to them all the time. Uh, the other commendation was to do a better job or, or continue to improve how we use the core values and expectations to drive our instructional planning and our actual instruction. Also, we got kudos for reporting out to parents on civic and social expectations, but we were also, um, the recommendation was that we do a better job of reporting and also promote better understanding. Um, as we begin to shift towards a proficiency-based model in the high school in a few years, that will get better naturally. So that's gonna happen, I think. And again, this is from the staff. This is, yeah, the staff took the highlights that, they took the commendations and recommendations of the committee and then the ones that they highlighted when they talked to the faculty are the ones that you're seeing here. Does that make sense? Um, in curriculum, we've got high marks for the co-teaching model that we're using now uh, between special education in math and special education in English. That process has been about four years, and this is now the, the second full year of the co-teaching model. It's a model for the state. People come and visit us to check that out all the time. Um, we are commended for the higher order thinking skills we're using. Um, our common core toolkit that our English department developed using 1% money um, was also a commendation that that's a resource that anybody in the, in the faculty can go to and get ideas about how to implement common core practices in the classroom. And the phrase that the chair used is he said they all have 1% envy. Um, they love the idea of the 1%. They like the way we do that. They think it's a great model for professional development. And they like the idea that we offer that for staff to do during the summertime. I think that's a great thing. Um, recommendations, and these really kind of go along with what we're looking at as we move to Common Core, um, a vertical alignment of curricula. And by that, uh, they recommend that we look at how, uh, what our eighth graders are doing before they come to high school and make sure that our curricula are aligned. So we know when a student enters ninth grade that we know what they've done previously. Uh, and the, again, the Common Core kind of spells that out as well. Uh, also that as we move through the years, grades 9 through 12, that we also have a sense of how those curricula are aligned. So we have a sense that when students finish, we're confident of what they've completed here. Um, they'd like us to do a better job of collecting and using learning expectation data. Right now, we collect information on civic and social expectations. We collect it, we report it out but we don't have a clear action plan on how to use that information. And that's gonna take some time. And this is just the second year we reported it, so we're getting better at that. Um, one of my favorites was to ensure that the written curricula are the taught curricula. The idea that what we have done on paper and we say we're going to teach versus what's actually taught in the classroom. Um, that gets to the whole idea that we offer each of our students um, the same curricula, whether they're taking Algebra one with this teacher or with that teacher that they're getting a consistent, um, common core um, of information to use. And that's something that you know, we've wrestled with for many years since I've been a teacher here. Um, and that's, I'm not surprised to see that. And also, to help with that process is a recommendation to provide more professional development aimed at curricular development, specifically looking at universal design practices and how can we start with what we want students to know, and then do our instructional planning backwards to get to the lesson plan. Um, in instruction, we were commended for what they call authentic learning. Uh, specifically, they lauded us for BUHS Abroad, which the board has been very supportive of in the past, and also our TV production. <coughs> Experiences where students are doing real world applications in the classroom. Uh, the language department was lauded for their leadership in using the learning expectations. Um, Judy Aviscal in previous years, and now Karen Sebastian, they do a great job in their department of making sure that we're using learning expectations and that 
that they're assessing kids explicitly on those ex expectations. Um, we are commended for our technology integration. The fact that we are moving to a one-to-one -one beginning next year for ninth graders. Um, the idea that we are, you know, many of our teachers take iPad workshops, um, that every teacher has a, a laptop computer, that we have, you know, the Elmo projector. So all of those things that the board has supported, we are commended for. And they also commended this teacher and student initiative in taking control of their learning and their teaching. Um, they noticed that students were, were comfortable asking teachers um, for clarification. They were comfortable asking for new different ways to be assessed. Recommendations, again, back to the learning expectations, which are still new to us, making sure that instruction is explicitly connected to the expectations. Um, keep that commitment to technology. Um, they'd like us to expand the authentic learning opportunities if we can. Um, you know, I kind of look at that as doing more mentorships in the community, doing more co-op kind of programs at the high school and career center to kind of get kids into the um, community more. I think the STEM Academy and the Arts Academy are going to play a big role in helping that. And the last one there, which is cut off, it's providing formal time for faculty to meet, plan, and discuss instructional strategies. The idea that we need to give the faculty time to um, collaborate together. And that's another thing that came up throughout the report. Um, in assessment, again, we are commended for that civic and social. The idea that we actually give an explicit grade on how students do in their civic and social um, awareness rather than just on a number for biology that we include. You know, how do they do with creativity? How do they do with their work ethic that we, that we assess those and inform parents of those? Um, also, the fact that we use a lot of rubrics and they're public, so students, when they get an assignment, already know how they're going to be assessed on it. And the idea that we use a whole range of different assessment styles, so students have some freedom to choose how they're assessed. But we balance that with some common assessments. And specifically, in the math department, um, we are commended for the program called Assistments, which um, is a program that allows them to give a common assessment and get instant feedback. Um, since the reports come out, we've expanded that, and school-wide, we're using something called ProProps, which does the same thing, but um, teachers can embed YouTube videos, links, uh, works of art, uh, so that students can answer a more in-depth question. And again, that's common assessment, immediate feedback to the teacher and to the student. Um, recommendation is that we continue to improve how we give feedback to parents and to students about how they're doing with the learning expectations, that we um, move our A, B, C, D um, grading system to be aligned with the learning expectations more explicitly. Um, and that's not a surprise. And again, the idea of collaborative time came up again. Um, with school culture and leadership, uh, one of the commendations that was noted right away was that the staff, and that actually should say staff and students, that's my mistake, um, work to create a consistently safe, positive, and respectful environment. I was glad to see that. Um, that's one thing that we're, we work hard on every day. Um, we were commended for eliminating some of our leveled classes. Uh, though there was a recommendation that we continue to look at that. Um, you guys got some props. Um, the relationship between the school board, superintendent, and principal, that um, the relationship is focused on student success. and. Um, uh, the other thing that the chair said to me is he said he had school board energy as well, um, which I thought was okay. And uh, that we have, the school has a clear vision that is firmly rooted in our, in our core values. Um, again, recommendations in this area would be for school culture to um, provide collaborative time, increase parental participation, and develop and expand leadership roles for students and for teachers. And that's something I've thought a lot about and um, one thing I want to look at starting next year is how do we, you know, student council is an active um, group, but how do we move beyond the traditional student council person and get a wider range of students involved in school leadership? So that's a challenge for the future as well. Uh, for school resources for learning, these are things within the school. Uh, we are commended for our social emotional wraparound services, the idea that we have a clinician on staff, uh, the idea that we have a student assistance counselor on staff, we're commended for those things. Um, our restorative justice program, 
um, got some, won some praise, as did our advisory system. The idea that students do see an adult every day for, for four years that they're here. Our ACE period um, got some praise. The idea that we have dedicated time for students to go get some help. And also our librarian connection with departments. And you don't know it, but Marilee Atley um, does a phenomenal job of making connections with every single department. And somebody asks her for some resources, whether they're online or print media, she will work until she finds everything that they could possibly want. She does a phenomenal job. And so she was um, noted for that. Um, yes? Absolutely. What did you mean by one of the commendations was that the students in advisory are able to see an adult every day? So in advisory, the, the idea behind advisory is that every day when they come to school, there's the advisory time. So every day, students will see that one adult for four years. Oh, one adult. So right. So we know there's a consistent adult. You know, for example, I have seniors this year, and I've seen those kids every day for four years, which is, yeah, yeah. As I look back on them as freshmen, it's a little scary because they are so different now. It's kind of neat. Um, for recommendations that we work to make families more aware of all of our support systems, and that was another theme that came up um, in the report, that we have a lot of great programs and support systems in place, both academic and social, but we need to do a better job of making them public and letting people know they're there. And, and I, I totally agree with that. So that's one thing that this summer that the administration is going to begin to work on is how do we make sure that those are public and well known. Um, they also said that we need to formalize the connection between the librarians and the departments for curricular planning. I thought that was interesting that it was a commendation and then a recommendation. <coughs> but the, the idea is that it happens, but they'd like to see it um, codified in a more formal manner where uh, I think they want the librarian to have specific time with each department, and I think yeah, that's maybe a great you're it. It's recommendation. Yeah. Right. Oh, that's it. It's a recommendation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, the other one was to uh, continue to expand student support systems during and after school, and um, our counselors are aware of that. And I think they do a great job now, but I think they could, you know, they do more. Like, you know, right now we're running. Um, everything from grief groups to anger management groups during the school day, and they'd like to see more of that. Um, with, the, with the community resources, um, we are commended for the long history of community support. Um, you know, they looked at several of our, of our budgets, and they looked at several of the budget vote outcomes, and um, they were astounded at the community support we get. The idea that the building um, project passed on the first vote, even though that was predating the last visit, um, it just shows a long history that this community supports its school and supports its students. And uh, they noted that right away. Um, the physical plant, as not surprisingly, got a lot of kudos, uh, both with the way it's staffed. Um, we got specific mention that having a master electrician on staff was great. Having a master carpenter on staff was great. Um, and also the dedication to efficiency. And we know what Robert Clark has done in that area. Um, we we're commended for our partnerships with HCRS and um, the Prevention Coalition and other agencies. The idea that we're open to having them come in, that we work closely with them on things like our conversation about prescription drugs, our conversations about teen teenage drinking. Um, we we're commended for the community internship opportunities we have. Um, the summer school, because it was so community focused, career and college ready focused. And uh, we're also giving kudos for the family intervention position that Bill Jan is occupying right now. Um, for recommendations, um, technology-wise, to assess our connectivity, um, that's been a constant battle. And I think it will be for a long time. The idea that we, wanna, we need to make sure that when a student wants to go online, or the teachers want to go online with the class, that it's there, that it works flawlessly. It doesn't always, um, but I think it's getting better since we got those big disks um, rather than the old style uh, modem, we've gotten much better. Um, continue to develop our short and long-term technology goals. You know, we kind of know <clears throat> our focus for the next four years is going to be um, the one-to-one -one initiative, making sure that students have access to technology, but also making sure they use it effectively. So it's not just, here's a computer, but the idea that we have a goal of what they're going to do with us. And also to improve our outreach to families that are in challenging um, conditions. Um, whether that's setting up a ride program to get to open house or parent conferences, 
whatever it might be, one of the things they want us to do is look at how do we do outreach to, to parents in need. Steve, can I ask a question? On, um, one of the um, <coughs> recommendations a few slides up was um, expanding authentic learning opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, we're commended for community internship opportunities. Are those not, um, are those authentic learning opportunities or are they opportunities that they we're are. just not taking advantage of enough? I mean, sort of a, a service learning type of thing where there's a real mm -hmm. academic tie back. No, those are both would be authentic learning opportunities. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering if there's yeah. a way to expand expand that. You know, oh, there is. The it, learning it, part of well, it. And in next, the as the STEM Academy and the Arts Academy expand, mm -hmm. part of the capstone course in both of those academies is a community-based learning opportunity where students will go out and work with a mentor and get in the field. So I think it's an expand. Mm -hmm. um, Can I just comment on the parent outreach? Sure. Um, at our recent Collegiate High School Steering Committee meeting, we talked about our um, ongoing parent orientations that we've done usually at the beginning of the year and beginning of each semester. And one of the things that we realize is we're getting about 30 parents, but they're not the parents of the first generation students that we really need to um, try to get to these meetings. So we decided that we would, um, in the invitation, ask if, if they needed transportation, if they needed um, childcare, um, we're able to provide that through community service and some other uh, grant money that we have for transportation. So we'll be, we'll be kind of implementing that and we're hopeful that we'll see a better turnout of, of parents that really, we want them to understand the uh, benefits of, of the program for their students. So that's just an example of what yeah. we're trying to work on. Okay. So the next steps for us is um, in the next week or so, we should get a formal letter from uh, the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. That letter will, will most likely say that we are accredited without conditions. It could say that we're accredited with conditions or, as we remember from the last report, we could be placed on probation. Um, um, nobody thinks that's going to happen to us. You know, they think we're going to be accredited. Um, I, wouldn't, I, I would be shocked if anything else happened. Um, then next fall, we'll begin a follow-up committee. We'll form a committee that will <coughs> actually look at what they give as recommendations for us. And what we do is we get a list of recommendations and we can either say we're gonna work on these or we can say, well, we're gonna work on these instead, but we have to document why we're gonna go off of what their recommendation is. Um, that process is pretty um, innocuous, to be honest. Um, then in about nine years and three months, we'll have our next visit. So. Get ready for that. It's going to be on a Sunday again. It'll yeah. probably start on a Sunday again. What's the date? Uh, <laughs> Russell, tell us. Um, let's see. And that's it. I, oh, before I forget, I do want to recognize a few people. Um, first of all, I want to recognize Doug Crock and Rick Lane. They were the chairs of the, steer, of the committee for the self-study. They worked tirelessly um, for many months to prepare the report, to shepherd the committees towards completion. I can't say enough about what those two gentlemen did. Um, they went above and beyond in every sense of the word. Um, Nancy Johnston as well. You know, she provided support for, for Doug and Rick and myself as we were going through the process and through the visit. And um, her work, um, collecting data, um, making sure that you know, our I's were dotted and our T's were crossed, and uh, keeping us on a timeline was really important. Um, each of the standards committees had a chair, and they were Peter Canizero, Michelle Hood, Lindsay Levesque, Liz Denord, Marilee Atley, Lisa Johnson, and Bruce Holloway. They worked every Thursday for 18 months with a group of um, seven to 10 teachers. And they were the people that were responsible for each segment of the, of the self-study, which then became every segment of the final report. Um, their work was incredible. Um, and the staff in general, teachers, um, paraprofessionals, students, um, everybody here did a, a great job on this report. And um, I can't say enough about everything. And then, of course, the parents who took the Endicott survey, which was a very long survey, uh, who came to, the, um, came to the event on Sunday, and then who came and provided feedback to the committee. I mean, so this, really, this report really is a reflection of the support that this community, the staff, and the students um, all work together to make this a great school. So, so I think that's it. That's it. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.
I have copies if you want one tonight, you can have one, or I'll send you a PDF. Um, they're going to go to school libraries, uh, town libraries, and the town offices in the next couple of days. Could I just uh, make a comment, a uh, brief comment about the process? I, I want to acknowledge Steve's work um, in really the leadership involved with the whole process over really over two years. And, you know, some schools go through the routine, go through the process, and um, quite frankly, don't get a lot out of it. Other schools really take it seriously, and, and Steve really took this seriously from the beginning. The self-study is really an important aspect of this, um, and um, you get a lot of benefit working with small groups of staff, the whole staff, but really pockets of staff on these particular uh, um, standard areas, and uh, I, I can see how those discussions have moved the school in, in various ways that are, are really positive. And you know, the, the visiting committee, as, as Steve indicated, you know, they, they really saw a high quality program here. So, um, you know, under Steve's leadership, we really appreciate that that uh, seriousness in the approach for, for this school improvement work. One thing that struck me through just my little involvement with the process was that it didn't seem 